is frightful, but the Zoom is so delightful. In my living room, nice and warm. Let a storm, let it. Sorry, sorry, Terry, that was just no, no permissions. You know, we, we get shut down, copyright. Thank you all for coming out. 
I do want to remind you, um, I mean, I guess it's too bad, you know, this isn't next week, but next Monday we will not have class. So there's no class the week of Thanksgiving. Uh, then we will come back together the Monday after Thanksgiving, and I think we meet three Mondays in a row, and then we take off for the Christmas break. So, but I'll remind you of that. But just to make sure that I've reminded you, uh, we, we will not be meeting uh, next week. Um, there is some delicious pumpkin, is it pumpkin bars? Yeah. Man, it's like, it's pretty great, actually, I have to say. Uh, in the back, what? I do, I do. I have some right there. I've got a bite. Uh, I'm going to have a bite, I'm sure, at some point. Um, and there's, of course, water and coffee, and we welcome everybody online, folks, I think some folks who the weather was tougher, and then Mr. Tom Wynn, down there in South Carolina, get ready to come on up for the first snow of the season. <laughs> He's flying in next Monday, so. Um, all right, let me uh, let me say a up there, and then we'll uh, get started together. So uh, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much. Uh, we do thank you for this day, and we thank you for this first snow of the season that reminds us of the turning and the change that happens and the beauty of the snow and the silence that it creates in the landscape helps us to pause for a minute and to step back from the hustle and bustle and just enjoy that. We do pray, Lord, uh, for safety for folks out driving and walking. You know, this can be a more perilous time for that. There have already been many accidents. It's pretty good with people, even whether they're in an accident or not, um, keep folks safe and healthy. We ask and pray again that you be with us now as we continue our study of the book of Acts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That's pretty good. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. All right. All right. They doubled. Doubled the size. And good morning to everybody online. Um, can you all just give me a thumbs up if you can hear us? Great. All right. I think we finally, I think I finally also figured out how the microphone works. So you should be able to hear from people in the room as well. So this is our, uh, this is session seven of our study of the book of Acts. Uh, we are moving ourselves into, well, we are actually in chapter five, I guess I should say. Um, and that's kind of what we've been doing. Oh, oh, the one thing I will say is that I put the wrong question in the email I sent out to you. It was a repeat. I forgot. Uh, I meant to cut and paste in the question. So uh, if you noticed that, then yes, that was my fault. Um, if you didn't notice that, then that means you're not doing your homework. Um, it's, a, yeah, it's a profiling trick. All right. So what have, what have we done? Uh, what did we do last session? Um, We've gone through our beginning chapter two, chapters three and four, um, which uh, deal with um, the, the sort of spread, basically the initial spread um, of the church. Um, a healing happens, and then in chapters like the second half of chapter three and then chapter four, confrontation by the authorities. Um, and chapter four ends with this description of um, a community that uh, is pretty remarkable. It's typically called the second summary, and it puts a lot of emphasis on the sharing of possessions. We talked through that and then transitioned uh, last week to talk about one of the most disturbing episodes. Can you that? Yeah, I'm about to do that. Why is that up there? Sorry. Hold on for just one second. Um, well, they can't see it online. So just bear with me for one second, please. Where did they go? Oh, was no share of that one. Oh, 
Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, so I, I've made a point a couple times of emphasizing chapter two in Acts, which is clearly the most important chapter. Uh, when we got to this scene at the very beginning of chapter five, I said this has to be one of the most difficult set of passages. Um, this is the, uh, the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And without going into all the details, uh, you can certainly check your notes or go back and be watched from the last time. Um, I think what we came away with is that uh, the severity uh, of the treatment um, of these two folks because of the deception um, that they were trying to, to pull over on the community um, was, number one, very intense, and number two, probably has to do with a couple of factors, one of which is um, that their deception has to do with sharing possessions. Christian, and, uh, Christian, way... Christian yes? we at home, or at least I'm not seeing your video. It just says you started screen sharing, but there's no screen sharing coming through. Yeah, it was there, and then it it left. <clears throat> Same here. Just so you know. That's <laughs> Well, maybe they're going to have to just forget it. Yeah, all you guys should really just be in a room here. That's, that would, that'd be the, that's the best way to solve this problem. All right, let's try it again. Good. Thank you. I don't understand how it is. Why is that? All right. So we talked about Ananias and Sapphira. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the next point. Uh, so after after the discussion and uh, the episode with Ananias and Sapphira and the um, I mean the difficult scene, what we what we come away with is a couple of things. Number one, um, that the sharing of possessions um, was clearly. Uh, Deep, number one, deeply embedded in the practice of the community, and number two, had to do very much with the identity of the community. Uh, the part of, in other words, part of what it means to be Christian was to precisely share one's possessions in this kind of way, so that Ananias and Sapphira's betrayal of this, I suggested, was tantamount to a sort of a second Judas episode, right? So this, these are insiders who essentially betray the mission um, and uh, a main element of uh, the community. And they wind up being severely judged for it. Uh, we then moved out of that into a section that kind of picks up the story again of the confrontation of the movement with the authorities. Uh, and, and so there's basically material in chapter five, which is pretty much what we, we dealt with for the most part uh, through the rest of our time together. And uh, there's this description almost immediately right after uh, the Ananias and Sapphira event where it talks about uh, the apostles gathering together in Solomon's portico, performing signs and wonders, that people were really nervous about being, you know, like they wouldn't go near them, but they admired them. And then all of a sudden it says they start, they start going. But they start going in a way that's somewhat unconventional, right? They want access to what it is that they're talking about, the, the apostles and others, and the, and the power to be healed. Um, but we get these stories of people being just brought out and laid on the ground if uh, where the possibility of Peter's mere shadow might pass by. Yeah. Now, we didn't delve into the, some of the detail of that, but I think what we take from that is that this is literally an uncontrollable movement that in which in which this power essentially is kind of uh, spreading in means through means that are uh, certainly unconventional, right? So as I say up here, access to healing and God's presence is indiscriminately available, right? It's not just available through the temple. It's not just available through the normal channels. It's filled out in ways that are bizarre, really, if you think about that theme. Um, and of course, what does that, what, what we, we're not entirely surprised, but what that elicits is a response, right? Because uh, the verses just prior to our verses 
um, begin with, and the high priest acted, right? The high priest had to respond, essentially, is the idea. So the authorities respond to this movement that is kind of breaking out in ways that are um, uh, truly remarkable and, again, unconventional, but they respond in a very conventional manner, right? That is, they round up the apostles and put them in prison. Um, that's a pretty conventional uh, measure. Um, but the story then within that one, encapsulated within that one, has a kind of comedic tone because uh, putting them in prison isn't going to work because what happens, an angel goes in and lets them out late at night. Right? So again, you get this sense that like, the authorities are trying to fight against um, what is effectively uh, God's work. Right? I mean, this is God has been the primary character and continues to be. So um, they lock them up. And then they are set free uh, later in the evening, and then we get this really funny scene where the, you know, the, the, all the PhDs, I have a PhD, all the PhDs walk in the room in their robes, and they're, you know, they're peacocking in, um, only to find out that their prisoners aren't in prison, and in fact, they're doing the very thing you told them not to do in the very place you told them not to do it, right? And so they're made to look like fools, is kind of the idea. They then... Um, We'll drag them back. Uh, they, they have the apostles arrested and brought back, and we have sort of a bit of a scene um, with uh, Peter uh, speaking on behalf of the apostles to uh, the Sanhedrin, to this council, um, and uh, and the boldness um, of Peter's speech has turns up just another notch. We've already had one speech like this, one encounter between Peter and uh, the Sanhedrin, in which there was a boldness there, of course, too, that's now turned up again another notch or two. Um, and that's pretty much kind of where we are. And I think, I think sort of the, the picture then is, um, uh, uh, I think, picks up on the very last of the bullet points there, um, that the wisdom and authority of the elite is withering in the face of God's action, which is happening in and through these uneducated bumpkins from Galilee. That's kind of the picture that you get. Um, and their boldness is kind of stepping up. So that's why in our passage it picks up and we hear that they're getting more and more angry. Right? Their response is growing through frustration because they don't know how to set it down. So that's kind of where we are. I'd like to have a volunteer who's willing to uh, read our opening passage here. <laughs> Okay. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up and ordered the men to put outside, to be put outside for a short time. Then he said to them, fellow Israelites, consider carefully what you propose to do to these men. For some time ago, Judas rose up claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him, but he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and disappeared. After him, Judas, the Galilean, rose up at the time of the census and got people to follow him. He also perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. But if this plan or this undertaking is of human origin, it will fail. <laughs> but if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. In that case, you may even be found fighting against God. They were convinced by him, and when they called in the apostles, they had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. As they left the council, they rejoiced that they were considered worthy to suffer dishonor, the shape of the name. On every day in the temple and at home, they did not cease to teach and proclaim Jesus as the Messiah. Okay, there you go, right? Um, so uh, uh, just to recall at the very beginning um, here when we hear about the enraged, um, Peter's speech includes um, some very pointed things like uh, you were responsible for hanging him on a tree, 
you or these are things that they're upset about, not just that Jesus is Messiah, but that they might be found guilty, et cetera, of, uh, of his death. Um, so their response here, as we see, um, uh, it becomes more ominous, I think it'd be fair to say. Uh, in verse 33, enraged and wanting to kill him, uh, we're going to, we're going to, uh, this kind of ratchets up and it's going to really hit a crescendo in chapter seven, basically. And what happens in chapter seven is, is Stephen. Stephen gives a speech, a very long speech, and we'll get to, I think, some of Stephen today. Um, and that will end in Stephen's death. Um, and he is, is generally considered the first Christian martyr. Uh, but already here, we see the potential for violence uh, that's going to become a part of the story as we move through. Um, now, these folks are upset, um, but we have an intervention. Um, and I think it's interesting, this intervention, um, because what it does is it tells us that the council itself may not simply be um, interpreted as a homogenous entity. Like, in other words, not everybody on council might necessarily agree with the leadership of the council. And to have this intervention by Gamaliel kind of raises that possibility. Gamaliel is also connected to Paul, as we're going to find out. Um, and, of course, we know that he was a historical person. So Gamaliel, um, his, his dates of flourishing, uh, in which he's teaching or gets, you know, comes to be a known figure are about 25 to 55 AD. So that's what the FL there refers to, um, lacking dates for precise dates for birth or death. As I mentioned, um, he's a, he's a teacher of Paul and he's well known, um, in Palestinian uh, Judaism in sources outside of Christian texts. Um, one such source uh, I found that I thought was kind of interesting that one of the commentators mentioned, um, uh, this says, uh, when uh, Rabban Gamaliel the Elder died, the glory of the law ceased, and purity and abstinence died. And that's meant to be, of course, a, uh, an exaggeration, but nevertheless a, an affirmation of how highly respected Gamaliel was um, uh, by his peers uh, during his time of life. Now, what is the argument that Gamaliel gives? Let me kind of repeat this here. Um, he said to them, starting in 35, fellow Israelites, consider carefully what you propose to do to these men. For some time ago, Judas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. But he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and disappeared. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up at the time of the census and got people to follow him. He also perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. Because if this plan or this undertaking is of a human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. In that case, you may be even found fighting, you may be even, even be found fighting against God. All right, so Gamaliel is trying to make a point. I think the point kind of uh, is pretty straightforward in the text, but we can kind of draw out a couple of details. One is um, that these are, in fact, two um, actual historical people that we know about in sources outside of Christian scripture, particularly Josephus uh, mentions both um, Judas and, uh, and Judas. The one difference is that Luke has their dates kind of backwards compared to Josephus. Um, that may be that Luke just didn't know the precise dating, whatever the case may be, but nevertheless, uh, that is at least a detail uh, worth noting. There is an element here that is somewhat problematic, um, and that is that both of these movements, both the Sudius and Judas the Galilean movement, these are violent revolutionary movements. Um, that is very different than the, this early Christian movement, which we're talking about. So I think that at least is uh, is worth noting. Um, nevertheless, um, basically, uh, I'd say at this in this moment in this interlude, Gamaliel says something that we as readers know, which is resistance against what is going on in and through these people is futile because it's not about these people about the God who's moving them, right? 
And to resist this is, in fact, to resist God, um, to resist the spirit. Uh, so that really is uh, probably certainly the most important thing. And I think it would even be fair to say you could even make a case that Gamaliel's concluding sentence in some ways is like a useful way of describing the whole book of Acts, right? Um, if this movement is of God and you try to resist it, it's going to be like fighting against God. And then, of course, the idea is you're going to fail in, in that regard. Um, so, and I think I, I, I included this as I was re reflecting on it. Um, this last little piece, I'd say, it says there, this notion should also be applied to the church itself in different places. And what I mean by that is that we find in the story of Acts that there are times when the church also resists what God is doing. Or when the church seems to be somewhat lukewarm, what God is doing. Um, and that particularly is the case when it comes to the in, beginning to include uh, Gentiles without for, enforcing them or forcing them to become Jews. Uh, so you can see that same logic has to be also learned by insiders as much as it does by outsiders. All right. So then um, it, it tells us in uh, the second half of verse uh, 39, they were convinced by him. So uh, for whatever reason, Gamaliel's logic seems to convince, but I do have a question mark here because it sort of convinces them because they, they, they don't let these men alone. They, they have them flogged, right? And, uh, and there's a couple of uh, things to note here, right? One is um, the severity of flogging. Um, flogging typically included uh, up to 39 or 40 lashes, often with a cat and nine tails, and um, and people were known victims were known to die from the uh, brutality of experiencing flogging. So this was not like you're getting a spanking, basically. This is like a very serious and severe punishment, and. It go, I mean, we, we need to say this, but they are having men flogged whom they haven't even put on trial to determine if they're guilty or not. And think about that. So when we say that they're convinced by Gamaliel, we want to kind of be uh, careful in that regard because I'm not sure that he would have necessarily signed off uh, on something like that. It does, of course, show us, again, yet again, the duplicity and the questionableness of the leader of the of the leadership of the people, the elite. Um, right? We've seen in, in the trials now. We've had basically three, I think, three different trial scenes. Um, we have seen that they are motivated primarily by concerns and fear of losing their power. They're motivated by jealousy. Um, they are, and they they are not motivated by the truth. And so that kind of culminates here where they're willing to inflict violence on bodies um, that is quite severe without even determining one way or another whether they deserve it or not. We have a show of power uh, and authority. And I think we get that in the sense that uh, in, in conclusion in verse 40, so they were convinced by him and when they had called in the apostles, they had him flogged, for one, right? And they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So that's why they flogged them in order to shut their mouths. Um, how did the apostles respond? <laughs> well, uh, I think this is actually pretty remarkable. Um, uh, if, if we're talking about a genuine flogging, the idea that they would rejoice um, has to be, I think we have to carefully think about well, what is rejoicing might be looked like in this case. It doesn't look like some of the artistic renditions of the apostles hopping and skipping and jumping around as they leave because they were allowed to suffer. It means they probably are limping out and having to help each other move forward, right, physically speaking. So it has to mean something deeper, I think, than that. Um, just like joy is not the same thing as happiness or hope is not the same thing as optimism. They are, these things are deeper um, than, than oftentimes our notions of them are. So this is, I think, remarkable. Yet again, it's a remarkable response also 
to what has been done to them. And so we get back to that logic of um, the remarkable, the unconventional, the uncontrollable over against the conventional, the expected, et cetera. That kind of dialectic seems to continue to play itself out. And, and I want to say uh, here, so that's, that's verse 41. I think verse 42 to me is sort of the most like stick in the eye uh, passage, right? Because not only do they do that, but what do they do? They go back every day, now the day to the temple and do the same dog on thing, right? It says, and every day in the temple and at home, they did not cease to teach and proclaim Jesus as the Messiah. Right? And they were literally just told two verses earlier to stop speaking about it and we're going to beat the crap out of you. Just so you know, you didn't do that. So nevertheless, they do. Now, why do they do that? I think what we can do then is go back to an earlier scene where um, the first scene where the apostles were let go. They're not punished, but they go and they pray. And who do they, they pray to the great king? They're the true authority. And what do they ask for? They don't ask for safety. They don't ask for arms. They don't ask for, you know, whatever. They ask for boldness to continue their 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 task of being witnesses. So that, I think, is how we can think about how they were able to respond. More than likely, that kind of theme replays itself, even though it's not here um, uh, and, and, or made uh, explicitly. All right, let me stop. And... Uh, I was wondering whether um, the rising up of people who claim to be saved, saviors, and particularly you know, just the kind of saviors, fit into the notion you like this time, uh, was um, common, or were these two actors kind of unusual or, um, for that time? Was there a kind of an uprising of this kind of Movement at this time when Christ appears, yeah, could be confusing to the authorities, wondering, you know, is this real or not real or whatever. Yeah, I think uh, so. There's a couple. There's two layers of that question. There's the Jewish layer and there's the Roman layer. Well, the Jewish layer, yes, there are um, after the Maccabean um, kind of revolt against the. Um, what was left of the Greek Empire, um, Iacus of Tiffany's, and the Seleucid dynasty. I'm just trying to remember the dynasty. And there's a little brief window of actual Jewish independence before they become a client state. Um, I think the Maccabean revolt becomes a kind of blueprint for how we could resist others. And so others take up that kind of blueprint. Um, that's also the first place where we really hear about people willing to die for their faith, um, at least in terms of our kind of Western texts, uh, because the Maccabees are, will, are, are willing to die rather than bend the knee um, to the power that they're struggling against. Once the Romans, though, come in and make this area a client state, um, then you're going to get more and more resistance. And one of the reasons why I mentioned that there's a Roman layer is that this that that resistance and sort of this kind of constant resistance um, theme or banditry theme, you can find that across the entire Roman Empire. Like we typically will hear about the Pax Romana, which is the Roman peace, which was supposedly this time. It, I mean, that's also a time in which there's like 135 different uprisings. But whether or not, I mean, I, in other words, it's propaganda, basically. They, they were able to lower slightly the amount of piracy, is what I would say, in terms of what the Romans were effective, effective in doing. But when they, come, when they come in and they sort of take charge and they tell you, you know, we're basically, we're better than you, and that's going to fuel from the ground up a response. And that's why then you have all these kind of things going on mm -hmm. in other places. Yeah. Christian, you seem to imply that that was flawed leadership uh, in terms of flogging before they had even found that they had done something. Wrong. There was no sense justice. And I'm wondering. Or concern uh, about the truth or any of that. Concern about yeah. the truth, exactly. Or even, even formal procedures. Uh, that's your point. I'm wondering in fact 
whether that's actually delineated in terms of what is good leadership, flawed leadership, if that's there's an inference of that. I think I'm right. I know you're right. <laughs> and I think I think it actually agrees with me. No, I, I would say I do really believe that this is the opinion that we find. Um and for instance, it really will culminate with Stephen. Um, and the argument with Stephen is he's accused of um, speaking badly against the temple and um, uh, renouncing the traditions of Moses. And these two things are, are together, they constitute in some sense the traditions of Israel. And whoever speaks in the place of Moses in some sense speaks as a leader of the people. And so part of what is at, at stake in, in Stephen's speech is who is the proper interpreter of Moses? And where can God really be found? And what you find is that the opponents of Stephen, who should be the proper authorities, in fact, show themselves not to be. And so we get that sort of all along the way, I think, is what we, we got the earlier episodes. We have this episode now where they're willing to punish someone without actual, like without going through any kind of what seems to be a procedure, declaration of guilt or anything else, simply because they're jealous of the people. I do think it's a sub theme um, at play here. It definitely comes straight out of Luke, out of the gospel of Luke. So, so that decision to do that, is that, is that coming from the priest? Is it by consensus? Is it the council? I'm not sure if I, I, I don't know. It, my, some notes in my Bible here say that Gamaliel and the, and the Pharisees are almost somewhat supportive or allies because they believe in resurrection, which the Sadducees don't. Yeah. When they elect a priest or somebody becomes a priest, does he come from either Pharisee or Sadducees or some? I don't get how this works. Well, that's a great question. Um, now you're going to really test my like yeah. minutia knowledge. Uh, my understanding is that the Sadducees, Pharisees, and Temple elite are discrete and distinct bodies or different of um, cohorts. Um, and so it's not so much that when you when they elect a priest that they take one from the Sadducees or the Pharisees, they take from from their own ranks. Um, so they have their own ranks. The the question about Gamaliel as a Pharisee though has been kind of raised because like in other words, why does Gamaliel raise his voice and do this intervention? And it could, in fact, be because there's more in common with the Pharisees and, and these early Christians. Remember, the Pharisees are basically rabbinic Judaism. Like that's the movement that's going to survive uh, after the destruction of the temple. And so there's an awful lot that's similar between rabbinic Judaism and early Christianity. And so that could be why he's motivated, but the context doesn't give us much more than that at all. In terms of delineation and determination about punishment, I typically I would think it would have to come from the high priest or some you know kind of small grouping, but I don't know enough to say for sure. Yeah. It's not so much leadership; it's just control. Yeah. Yeah. I, like there is there were scenes, for instance, in the Gospel of Luke where. Um, in Jesus interacting with the people who are supposed to be the leaders of the people, what, you're, what they're shown to be is people that um, these leaders um, they don't they don't care for them. they actually hate despise the people, right? And so that that the hypocrisy of it, right? That you're supposed to care for these people, you're supposed to be um, making the law accessible to them. You're, you know all those kind of shepherding elements. Um, that is always a sub theme that they have abandoned their responsibility in a sense. And, and maybe Jesus, could, his message could be understood as a, you know, hit from that, turn from that into a different way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, one of your I was hoping you would jump in, Tom, because I figured you might know some more minutia. What, what, <laughs> one of the questions you asked was uh, the high priest. It would have come from the Levitical order, and a lot of the Sadducees were part of that. Um, 
grouping. Um, but also during the Mac being there, there was a changeover from um, it's uh, Priestley Watt and the Zadok, right? Oh. Into uh, an off, uh, a different Levitical line, right? So, and so they were part of the it produces the Essenes who right. hate that other line, and right, and distrust uh, that that something is not right, no. 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 or the whole temple scene is not right, yeah. No. Um, thank you. I, I some of my some of the kind of Pharisee strategy as being you know those kinds of areas I will lead in and kind of understand and I'll find out five years later that all the research and all the historical data has changed. <laughs> They're like, oh, we were well, well, you know, we weren't like quite right about that. Actually, it's from this, you know, so it's I, I so I've kind of given up on making sure I know all of the. Uh, the detail in that regard, but thanks for, for bringing that in. Did that truth have a link in that case? I know the Essenes were talked about this. Up in here. Oh. Yeah, the, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls were, um, um, the Kumran Scrolls are a cache of texts of this this SE movement. And they've given us a lot more detail, but there's even further stuff like inscriptions and things of that nature that are kind of constantly coming in. Um, all right, let's move on into our next scene, um, transitioning into chapter six. Could I get a volunteer who's willing to read uh, this passage? <laughs> <laughs> now during those days when the disciples were increasing in number, Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. The twelve called together the whole community of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task, while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and to serving the word. What they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles prayed and laid their hands on them. The word of God continued to spread. The number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Okay, thank you. Um, so I do want to say that this is the passage that I kind of wanted to focus on, um, and I, I do have sort of our discussion question built around this particular passage. Um, in part because what I think we see here is the flexibility of structure. Um, and so the question of what are the ways that we need to be more flexible? What are ways that maybe we need to think about how we organize ourselves, et cetera? Does you have that going on here? Um, first of all, just an observation. I, I will read from time to time passages, particularly if it's relevant. Other times I might skip over. But in verse 1, we get a couple of different things that I think are worth noting. So I'm going to read this. Now, during those days when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. So there's two things here that I think are important. Number one is that the community is growing significantly, right? Um, and, and therefore, the scene that's about to play itself out and this sense of kind of disagreement, critique, criticism, frustration um, is easily understandable, right? When you when you start a movement and you have maybe certain structures at the beginning of that movement, and the movement matures, grows, and expands, you may find that those initial structures are not up to the task of this new reality. And that's really the sort of transition that we see here, um, I think. Now, to the details of the actual disagreement, right? So there's Hellenists and Hebrews 
um, what do these words seem to mean? It's not precisely clear, um, and I say this based on looking at five different commentators, um, it's not precisely clear, particularly what Hellenists uh, mean, but I, I, I am going to, I would um, favor the idea that we're dealing here with Palestinian Jews and Diaspora Jews. The Hebrews refers to people who live in Palestine, who speak Aramaic, is a form of Hebrew, and Hellenist refers to those who primarily speak Greek and probably therefore live um, outside of or come from outside of Palestine. So this is a conflict, in other words, of two internal groups within uh, larger Judaism, and it's kind of replicated itself um, within the church. And we know that there were sort of disagreements, right? And it's not hard, I don't think, to step into the shoes of how one group might feel superior to another group, right? Particularly if the promised land means, um, you know, so much, right? So obviously I'm better than you because I get to live in the promised land. I might look down on you because you can't even speak Hebrew or Aramaic, you know, et cetera. That could be the idea. Um, Whatever the case is, um, what we know from what the text tells us is that the current structure is not equitable um, and therefore is not working. So the 12 respond to this, and it's very interesting because even their response, there's some weird wrinkles in their response, and I'll highlight that for you um, as we think about uh, responding to challenges. So verses two through four, and the 12 called together the whole community of disciples and said, it's not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables, even though, what was it Jesus said about serving others? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task, while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and to serving the word. All right. So uh, you can kind of see where my like, question mark is going to go. Um, number one is they see a problem and they try to adjust, address it by changing part of the structure. They want to build a different structure to enable that the, the situation is more equitable. They don't want the Hebrew and Hellenist widows to you know, not be having the same access. So they're trying to solve the problem. Um, and so... Uh, this is also a very auspicious moment, really, in the life of the Christian church in general, because this is the invention of what comes to be called the diaconate. So the, the whole idea of an office of deacon was rooted in this passage, right? That's what it means to serve, essentially. And so the diaconate are those who serve, uh, and they will go on to have different kinds of roles in the history of the church. Um, prior, the, the idea being in that prior to this, we don't have that kind of office in the church. This All right. Is, yes. But I but I love the qual, uh, qualifications for waiting on people. Right. <laughs> right. Full of wisdom in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, as you see here, and as I've already sort of out of the side of my mouth, I couldn't help myself, said, there's some irony in the description, right, in the qualifications, and in the way that the, the apostles frame what, it, what their solution is meant to address. Um, the first irony is the one that I already mentioned, which is, didn't Jesus say something about being a servant of others? Like, the way that they talk about we shouldn't waste our time waiting tables versus preaching the word seems problematic, I think, to say the least from that. Um, so Jesus commanded, in other words, that those who lead must be those who serve. The second thing is that the two first names in our list, Stephen and Philip, they are the only ones we're going to hear about throughout the rest of the book of Acts, and they are never waiting on tables. In fact, what are they doing? They are always preaching. So there's a kind of weird irony here that the people who supposedly are going to wait on tables we don't see them waiting on tables. We see them, in fact, doing the very thing that the apostles said they were going to keep for themselves. Now, that fact has raised the question of whether or not 
the apostles have a different motive than perhaps what God has. Right? That the apostles think they're addressing and changing the situation in one direction, but in fact, it's going to wind up being another direction. And so one of our most eloquent sermons is coming up in chapter 7, and who is it that's preaching it? Stephen, right? So, I mean, just, and Philip, who does Philip wind up witnessing to? The unit, you know, the Ethiopian unit. I mean, these guys play a significant role in these kind of hinge moments uh, in the life of the church, and it's not primarily through serving tables. So this has raised, again, this has raised a question, and I'm just saying it's a question to be raised, not that it's the right answer or anything like that. But whether or not this is one of those places in the text where we see the church thinking one direction and God thinking another, right? And that's something that we will see a few different places um, in the book of Acts, right? The church is moving in one direction and God's just be moving in another. It's going to have to pull the church along, right? And that could be the case. Yeah. Both Samaria and Martha. Yeah. How do you say it? Like, say it a little bit more. Well, um, you know, one, one was serving tables and doing the food, and the other was. Pouring at the feet of Jesus. Yeah, maybe there is some connection there as well. It's kind of opposite. It is the opposite here. That's right. That's right. Um, was another coming up? Back at the very beginning, the way he presented the that when the disciples were increasing in number, it looks like he was kind of calling their disciples the Jesus. Unless they just decided to do this on their own. Well, they were the ones who were distributing food because of the well, the, all the, all of the all, everyone in the community is considered a disciple. So when it says the disciples are increasing, they're basically saying the population of the community is what's increasing. But what, what about the other Jews? We're not part of it. We're not reading about the other Jews that are. We're, we're, yeah, now we're reading about we're reading about subgroups within the community. Exactly, and that has to do, I know it's a little confusing, but it has to do with the language that they probably speak. So remember, almost all of these early Christians are Jews. They're, they're Jewish. Who are the Hellenists? The Hellenists are the, the Hellenists. No, the Hellenists are the, they are diaspora Jews. They are Jews who live or come from outside of Palestine. And they primarily speak Greek, which is where the Hellene Comes from. So one is a group that primarily speaks Aramaic and Hebrew, and the other is a group that primarily speaks Greek. And they have certain competitions and animosities with one another that we know about beyond the, the Christian version. And so the fact that they're having a conflict here is not that surprising. That's kind of the, that's what the grouping is made up of. Yeah, so, so like, um, Saul Paul will be, um, he's a, Hellenistic Jew. He's Hellenist, yeah. Um, Barnabas. Uh, Barnabas. He's from outside of the country. Right. That's that's all they're saying. Right. And 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 I think it be and I mean there's at least some kind of scholarly um, uh, not skepticism, but sort of like um, as I'm looking for a word and I can't find it. It'll come back in a minute. In a minute but. They're, they're creating these scenarios oftentimes that maybe within the life of the church in general, there was a struggle between the church rooted at Jerusalem and the other churches. And we certainly see that, uh, interestingly enough, in Paul's letters. All right, so then we get the list of people. I won't read all the names. I think what we can take from this is that more than, first of all, all these things are Greek names, uh, but that's not an open and shut case. Uh, because uh, you, you lost your mic. Like five batteries on the other 
And all who sat in the council looked intently at him, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. All right. So you can kind of feel the uh, uh, the tension changing, right? Good bit. Um, it'd be fair to say that this is sort of our transition uh, passage into Stephen's speech, and then his eventual martyrdom. <clears throat> It sort of sets up the conflict as well for us. Um, in verses 8 through 10, um, Stephen is described as one you're awesome, who uh, performed signs and wonders. And uh, I'm about to perform a sign and wonder myself. <laughs> so I get the same look. Good. Good. Look at these sounds. Oh, we are back in business. Oh. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, so verses 8 through 10, then, um, Stephen is described as one uh, full of grace and uh, power, but it was in particular um, the descriptor uh, doing wonders and signs among the people. Uh, and, and this is another place it's probably just worth noting, right? that we never, ever hear about Stephen waiting on tables. Um, we hear these other things. So maybe they're talking about he cooked a really great meal. <laughs> but I don't think so. I think there's nothing more going on here. Um, what is important, it does seem to me, is this descriptor connects Stephen, um, you know, in a sort of uh, like a tissue connection um, back to Jesus, who's described as one, who performed wonders and signs back in chapter two, and upward to Moses, who is going to be a key figure in Stephen's speech as one who performs signs and wonders. And so Stephen himself, in a sense, is in this line uh, here. Um, and so uh, that kind of gives us a sense about who he is and where he fits. Now, also in these verses, we start to hear about a new camp of, op uh, of opposition. And this is uh, starting in verse 9. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and others of those from Cilicia and Asia, stood up and argued with Stephen, but they could not withstand the wisdom and spirit with which he spoke. So opposition is coming from a different quarter now. Um, and what is this opposition? This is basically Hellenist opposition. In other words, the earlier scene was clearly uh, opposition from those who are, you know, their power base is in Palestine and Jerusalem. And now we have a group whose power base is diaspora. So and this is a diaspora synagogue, essentially, uh, is probably the best way to put that. Um, sorry. So the synagogue of the freedmen, um, I think it'd be fair to say then that these are diaspora Jews. Now the freedmen also may have other connotations. That is those who used to be enslaved and are now no longer. Uh, but that was not something that kind of came up as often uh, in the commentators that I was uh, checking out. So no matter what the case is though, the text tells us what? They can't stand up to his wisdom. They cannot best him an argument. Right, and so um, the other power center has uh, not been able to best the apostles in argument. They haven't been able to shut them down or shut them up. So what do they do? They 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 physically abuse them. Um, now, uh, you know, interestingly enough, we're going to have a, a kind of mock trial to some extent. As much as this is going to be, it's going to end uh, very badly uh, for Stephen, at least. Um, in one respect, for sure. Um, 11 through 14, it tracks the tactics that this group is willing to go to to shut Stephen down. Um, then they secretly instigated some men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people as well as the elders and the scribes, and they suddenly confronted him, seized him, and brought him before the council. They set up false witnesses who said this man never stopped saying things against this holy place and the law. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place 
and we'll change the customs that Moses sent on to us. Now, um, one, I, one thing I didn't answer, I apologize, I should have up here, is why is resistance to Stephen coming from this quarter? Well, it's probably because Stephen himself is a diaspora Jew, and more than likely he's having a great effect among the diaspora Jews who are living in Palestine, and so they're responding to one of their own, essentially. So um, they can't best him in argument. They can't stand up to the wisdom and the power of the spirit. Is that working, Stephen? So they uh, revert to tactics that we're not unfamiliar with, especially if we've read the Gospel of Luke. Um, we're more than willing to basically bring trumped up charges against, uh, against uh, Stephen. They begin the process, right, with lying rumors. Um, they just kind of spread these lying rumors around. Um, and, uh, and then eventually they're able not only to convince the leaders, and, but very importantly, the people. Now, this is one of the first times that we see that the people begin to be turned against the movement. Um, and as you remember before, there was a, a clear, pretty clear division in the first few chapters that opposition did not come primarily from the people, came only from the leadership. Now that is that line is becoming much, much blurrier. Um, if we boil down the charges against Stephen, um, it is that um, he is in some way or another against Moses or the laws of Moses and the temple. So those are the two kind of things. And I think it'd be fair to say, right, the primary identifiers of uh, Jewish life, um, uh, at least in terms of religious life. These two topics are going to be addressed in Stephen's speech. We're not going to be able to get to all of Stephen's speech today. In fact, I might even skip us getting into his speech. Might wait to do that uh, next time because uh, just knowing outside. And uh, <laughs> uh, and I want to get folks. Uh, you know, we, we can kind of have it all together, hopefully. But it would be fair to say, as I mentioned before, that they together constitute the traditions of Israel. And so in some ways, the contest that goes on between Stephen and his accusers is really a contest about who is the true inheritor of, uh, of the laws of Moses in the temple, who's truly guiding the people rightly. And of course, the argument is that, um, that Jesus, the Jesus movement is, is of course, doing that. That clearly, that idea will have a very, very problematic legacy in the history, in world history, by the way, uh, because there will be an assumption that the church has replaced Israel, the Jewish people, and and then you're kind of pretty much on the road to Auschwitz. Yeah. You're saying that the synagogue of freedmen, they wanted to keep their synagogue together as a Jewish entity, more or less, and now Stephen is coming in and basically converting people to what we're calling the way or Christianity or whatever. So they would be against that, right? Right. I think that's sort of the plausible, very plausible deduction. That that's why the opposition comes from them, is because Stephen himself is a diaspora Jew, clearly well regarded, signs and wonders, et cetera. And so therefore they're they're concerned about keeping their synagogue together or being able to keep their people in line or something of that nature. Is there another hand over here? Uh, but of course, you know, um, Christianity wasn't a separate religion. It was just uh, a, splinter. a splinter group. Right. It's a subset. It's just, it would be ranged alongside the Pharisees and Sadducees. Basically. Right. Not a different religion. Uh, and I would suggest that doesn't happen until 350, 400 years later, really. Um, so, but in the meantime, there's this contest going on, and that contest can be boiled down to who is the true Israel, or who's being true, who's being true and faithful to traditions of Israel, or something like that, we might say. Um, and that's, I think, one way of thinking about this speech, is it's a contest like that. So those are the accusations, and then we get this very interesting, right, and kind of curious sort of deep breath before the plunge first, right? And all of us sat in the council looked intently at him 
and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Um, now, is this an observation that Stephen is a handsome looking dude? Uh, probably not. It, it is probably has maybe two connotations. Uh, the first one is the most important, and I would suggest this is the one that I have up here for you. And that is an angel was understood to be, they were understood as emissaries or ambassadors of God, divine ambassadors. And so to describe the appearance of Stephen in that way is indicative that what he's going to say represents the divine perspective. I mean, that's what we're going to get. The other meaning that we might be able to attach to it is a sort of sense of calm and serenity, potentially. Uh, but I think it's certainly the former is the most important one. Okay, so I had planned on possibly jumping into the speech. I think what we'll do, given that we're a little bit lighter, um, and I would love to be able to do the whole speech um, in one session. I'm going to skip starting. We're going to start the speech after Thanksgiving. Um, what I'd like to do is, though, still give us some time for our closing question um, and, and make sure that if you're, you're on tables with only two, maybe you guys want to combine or if you're coming to four or something like that. But this has a little bit of a preamble on it. Um, and it says, in Acts, the church often finds itself needing to adjust to new realities on the ground by developing new structures and models of leadership and ministry. That's the sort of assumption, the working assumption of the question. What are some examples that you can think of when the church has been flexible in its approach to ministry and mission? And you can draw out, you have to know something from the history of the church or it could be from this church or whatever. Uh, but the second one in particular, I'm interested to know, like, what do you think for us, right? What are some ways that you think the church now could become more flexible in its approach to ministry and mission? I'm going to give you like five to seven minutes for a conversation on your table, see what it develops, what comes of it, and we'll come back together and, uh, and share. Um, I can put folks online into a, into a room. That's what I'll do.
and about or about the willingness to reconstruct or restructure um, ourselves to do more effective ministry and mission. Uh, what were some things that just came up at your table, things that you discussed based on, on the topic? We got flexible in the sense that, we, that, we not, that our church now does an alternative service that is not the typical alternative service. So we got totally off on that topic. So we addressed that part about being flexible, but then we talked about traditional versus alternative service. Yeah, so, well, I think, I mean, I think that's a kind of innovating, you know, sort of, it can be described in that way. Yeah, go ahead. It was traditional alternative. Mm -hmm. It was God Jesus or no God Jesus. And that? I'm not sure there's no God Jesus. Well, uh, um, what we were saying was that, like, the alternative has, has is fulfilling its need of bringing people in we're bringing people either without faith backgrounds or with um, previous faith backgrounds that they've rejected. We succeeded in bringing them in. But we, the word we kind of came up with was like the meat. You go to traditional, and it's like that's like that's the meat of like Christianity. It's God, it's Jesus. An alternative, it's there, but it's in a different way. It's yeah. Effective. It's conversation. And but to your point, you were saying is in the Sunday school. In the Sunday school, I. I was able to help for the first time. I'm going to be doing it once a month. No God, no Jesus. And the, there was a little thing outside from Berry Patch that, that said during Berry Patch that particular day they were going to work on scissors. I got into this Sunday school class. There were five. I think they were six, four, somewhere in there. Sunday school. No Jesus, no God. And everybody included, everybody loved, everybody cared for, everybody safe. Oh me. That's like Sunday school. That's that that's not acceptable. I'm not a leader. That's where we went. That's I, I my own call. <laughs> In a sense that I gave you the question. Well, I think that's per I think to me that's perfectly legit as a topic to talk about. Um, flexible, but, well, maybe, maybe the connection is uh, possible. Yeah. So, thank you though for sharing that. Um, others, yeah. Well, when you put out a survey, um, yes. a questionnaire with the idea of wondering about how to change the mission of this church. Or to add to the mission, add to the mission of the church, yeah. with education and reaching out into the community. And another thing, and what I talked about, food. and um, you know, these organizations want you to send a check. They don't really have workers that can distribute it, so they don't want all those cans and boxes. But it's possible for a church in this area to partner with a church. In Minneapolis, and this, but that church would provide the workers, and then the food can go to that church, and the church would know to be, uh, be able to distribute it. So you actually would be distributing directly into the community. I don't know what something like he does. It's more that they want money. Steps want money. But where is 
Right. But you were you you were thinking about alternative ways of being well, yeah, effective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Part of your mission is to take care of. Right. Well, I was just going to say by joining with other churches rather than being siloed churches, but really working together. Well, so we should be part of a denomination. Part of a what? <laughs> but 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 the idea you're kind of what you were talking about in a sense is that as you make these pivots, it's good to make it with and in concert with other communities because you can be more effective together. And there's a whole host of reasons, right, why that's a good idea as opposed to just doing something by yourself. I mentioned that when we were really large, we had to do gathering groups, which divided us all in, up into small churches that yeah. met between early service and late service, because then you got to know 50 people that you prayed for, people gave their testimony, you socialized, because you came in and you didn't couldn't meet, you didn't meet anyone. You right. had to go to service for an hour, and people didn't talk to you, and you'd leave. So that was kind of the solution at that time. Yeah. Just to subdivide and get the group stronger and yeah. people knowing each other. Yeah, I think the whole kind of uh, small group phenomenon and it said start in the 17th century as a way to address the idea that a single parent church could have up to 20,000 people in it. And they needed to break it down so that people actually could get to know each other now, I'm not sure they really use that language, but if they really wanted it was uh, people learning how to pray and read scripture together. But then of course the fellowship part would be a part of that. So I think that's right. I think this is kind of flexible structure strategy uh, to address a need, to address a new challenge. And it was a you know, it was a good problem to have in some ways. Yeah. I was just reminding myself of you know a major effort that Arthur did back some years ago when the drought and the disasters in Africa were going on, and uh, they formed something called the Christian Missionaries of Minnesota, which embraced, you know, a half a dozen churches or more from our community. And they worked together to uh, put strategies together to help in Africa. And Arthur was very much part of that. But it was a chance, an example of churches coming together to work common problems. Uh, that's great. That's and that went on for some years. Yeah. In some ways. Well, and just to, to kind of close the loop, I mean, I when I talk about this uh, center, whatever it's going to be named, the Center for Theology of the Neighborhood is one option. Meeting House Center for Community Education is another. I'm partly imagining re completely revamping adult education um, in a way that kind of you know also provides a platform in which and through which lay people can also teach. Uh, so that's part of my hope is that we have so many people with great knowledge in our community. Maybe it's not necessarily in the area of theology or something like that, but it's the kind of thing that we can share with our broader community while also having people like myself and there's several other folks here who have advanced degrees. They're not on our staff in theology, history, ministry, or whatever, tapping into them because we have this gift have this spread um, in a sense, and we should find the strategy and the structure by which we can give it away. Oh my God. Oh, just teach. Right. I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm imagining, I've been getting emails from people in the congregation who, like, oh, second career, I went out and got an MDiv, or oh, I, you know, I did an MDiv, but now I'm doing, I work at the Historical Society, or, you know, they want to be involved. Melinda, you know, you probably talked to me about because you used to, you know, read Bible studies and things like that. So I'm hearing all that and I'm thinking, well, there's got to be some ways to have a structure that we can unleash that. Um, yeah. I would just uh, say that I think it's important for us to consider what is the distinctive value that we would bring to the neighborhood as opposed to replicating the community education programs that are all over the place. Right. Over yeah. But there are very distinctive things that we can do by bringing theology and practical issues to yeah. the neighborhood, I think. Right. Yeah. Well, it's a 
ago, uh, when Bob Masana was here, had the idea that this would be a satellite, kind of like a satellite seminar in Stockard Creek, so that students could, seminary students could come here and take Greek, and they wouldn't have to drive all the way over to Bethel. Um, yeah, but that was only for one year, so I don't know really what happened with that. But Well, if anybody's got the money, I'll start a seminary. <laughs> well, I was just going to say that one class. I just want to make sure you know. <laughs> no, that's right. I mean, and, and there's those are those are interesting programs actually that um, that are being tried out nationally as well. Uh, there's a program just like that at Candler down in Atlanta that works with First Presbyterian in Atlanta, and so those are those are very viable ideas um, that I'm also going to make. Last last comment. I was just going to say that. Uh, the comment made about the early service, the idea that people come, they're attracted, but then they don't have that next building block, which are, <clears throat> what are the Christian beliefs? What is common? The, basis of the, faith, yeah. the basis, basis of the faith, you know, learning the Bible, all the books, how it fits together, you know, history of the Bible, all these building blocks are missing, and then we jump in here, and we're at a college level. Mm -hmm. And, well, I would, and, in my defense, and, and also hopefully not impugning anyone in the room, I did offer an entire year of reading through the Bible last year, and the complaints I got were, I don't want to have to read that much. So it's not just my fault. It's not no, just about that was, we're not offering things. Or I don't think it was necessarily, don't want to read that much. It was, if it's a Bible study, per yeah. se, at least it's my, my experience. I started that class um, or went to your the Old Testament one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's a study, there is too much to read to really be a study. That's and true. And so to the. And so in y'all's defense, there's some truth to that. Well, in two yes. years' defense, I understand there's two versions of that book because there's one woman at our table who said, Oh, I came here to, to retake this disciple class, but. This must be the abbreviated version because mine was much more. There's evidently there's you know the longer version and yeah, we did the shorter version, right? But just the and everyone's like that's the shorter version, right? So I would have liked, in my case, I would have liked the version where you have a smaller pieces, but you can have more time to study smaller. Yeah. I think it just got to be too much to cover a to all those topics. Well, well, the, I will say that that kind of basic box. Okay. Is another thing that yeah. I'm hoping that the center, the idea of revamping adult ed, um, will be able to address um, a little bit better. Um, there is a challenge, I confess, uh, in this church, which is it feels a little bit schizophrenic, frankly, about these issues. Because on the one hand, I think there are folks who want to hear about the basics of the faith. Et cetera. And then on the other hand, I think there are folks who are like, well, what, what about freedom of conscience? And I get to believe what I want to believe. And I don't, and I have over my two and a half years have not figured out yet how precisely to thread the needle of those two things to affirm the freedom of belief, et cetera, but then also to like, with some level of authority, teach you that this is what the Christian tradition has believed. That's some of the tension between alternative traditions. Yeah. Right. So I think. Great for me. <laughs> and for all of us. For all of us, that's right. Still consider itself congregational. Yeah. It might even be two congregations. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, let me uh, let me just close this up with a quick a quick blessing. Thank you again so much for coming out on this our first snow of the year. Uh, to remind you and to remind our friends online, uh, we will not be meeting next week take one week off during Thanksgiving week, and then we come back the Monday after the Thanksgiving holiday. And I think we meet two or three uh, times up into December, and then we will take off uh, for our Christmas and New Year's time as well. Uh, so let me pray us out. Lord, thank you so much for, thank you for the book of Acts. Um, thank you for the challenges that it puts before us. Um, Thank you for the voice of the Spirit that speaks through it to us, into our hearts, and into our common life together. We pray for our church, Lord, for the life of our church, for the direction of our church. And our key prayer really is that 
as you continue to act in our midst, we will discern that and follow it faithfully. Know you are alive. We know that you are with us. Know that you are pushing us. And we want to walk or lean into that in ways that are productive, um, life-giving, and faithful and true. We ask and pray you be with us now as we go forth. Keep us safe. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.